This is Wellness by Design, and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Chloe Turner, a naturopath who has dedicated her career to helping patients with gut immune dysregulation disorders. And the fire in her belly is because Chloe has Crohn's disease herself. Welcome to Wellness by Design, Chloe. How are you going? Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm very well today. Our pleasure. Now, firstly, let's start off with Crohn's disease. Can you take us through a few of the hallmarks of Crohn's and put it also in the place of inflammatory bowel disorders, IBD? How does it differentiate from ulcerative colitis as well? They're very, um, I mean, they're the only two conditions identified as inflammatory bowel diseases at the moment, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And they are quite different in their presentations in regard to how it's viewed from a gastroenterology perspective. However, how we see symptoms is extremely similar. So it can be really hard when it comes to diagnosis without, you know, before going through a colonoscopy to identify what the likelihood is of each. Um, some indicators, I guess, well, I'll kind of take you through the differences between the two in that ulcerative colitis is only in the large intestine, whereas Crohn's disease is anywhere from the mouth to the anus. In saying that, 80% of people with Crohn's disease have the disease in their terminal ilium, so in their, their proximal um, part, oh, sorry, the distal part of the small intestine. That's the predominant place that we see Crohn's disease and therefore the symptoms are far more related to things like uh, abdominal discomfort um, and quite severe cramping. We tend to see a lot of nutritional imbalances with both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But I would say with Crohn's disease, it's a little bit more frequent, except for with ulcerative colitis, anemia and iron deficiency because of uh, blood loss in ulcerative colitis is far more common. The presentation gotcha. is very different. Sorry, go on. Yeah, oh, I was just going to um, uh, interject. Uh, so what about the skip lesions, though, and then the extra gut, extra gastrointestinal symptomatology? Yeah, so with both, I mean, they're both autoimmune diseases. And interestingly, this is actually quite new in regards of autoimmune disease uh, understanding that they're both recognised as autoimmune diseases now. So a lot of extra intestinal symptoms with both. Um, skip lesions are in Crohn's disease. So you can see lesions in the mouth, in the small intestine and in the rectum with Crohn's disease with completely healthy tissue in between. Whereas ulcerative colitis goes from the rectum and will only move in a continuous motion. And it's very much on the surface of the mucosa. So Crohn's disease can be very deep lesions, a lot of inflammation in, in the mucosa, um, more likely to cause strictures because of the inflammation. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, you're more likely to see wearing away of the digestive tract in that regard. Uh, extra intestinal symptoms, right. I really, I feel quite passionate about talking about extra intestinal symptoms, because that was a really big thing for myself. And I'll talk about that later if you like, but um, just as a, mm. like a broad overview, things that they look for a lot nowadays is autoimmune arthritis and inflammation of the eyes are really common in Crohn's disease um, mm. and in ulcerative colitis, but more so in Crohn's disease. And uh, you said extra things, but can we just touch on a horrible presentation, pyoderma gangrenosum? How common is that in Crohn's? Cannot talk to that, Andrew. <laughs> That's all right. No worries. It's it's Try again. really, but it, but it can be quite horrible for patients because these these lesions erupt from what is might appear for as at first as a an innocuous bump, and then it turns into a lump, and then the skin tissue just erodes, um, and you've got these horrible ulcers that look very, very similar to flesh eating disease or a bed sore, something like that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a, a decubitus ulcer, something like that. It's really quite dramatic and horrible for the patient to experience. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. sorry, forgive me, that that hasn't presented in yourself. That, <laughs> so well, keep I mean, going. 
I have seen ulceration of the tissues of external tissues in in patients with Crohn's disease, generally when they're on medication. So I'm interested to kind of understand that role and if it is to do with the disease itself or if it's to do with um, a mixture of the disease out of control with medication as well. So generally see that when people are on medication and they're not healing very well is these um, ulceration of the tissue, you know, especially around the the lower um I'm, I'm like pointing to my ankle. You can't see that, but I'm pointing to my ankle. <laughs> uh, you know, the, low, the lower limb. I tend to see yeah. that. But no, it's not okay. one I've experienced. I guess fistulas is, is um, something that is probably uh, the hardest thing I've seen to resolve in Crohn's disease and possibly I would say one of the scarier of the symptoms because, you know, you can have openings. Fistula can be an opening between the intestines and another part of the bowel. It can be an opening between the intestines and the urinary tract or into the vagina or into the outside skin. And because there's fecal mm. matter there where the opening is, I find that really um, very distressing for a lot of patients and extremely hard to heal. Not just very distressing. What about the safety issues there um, with regards to risk of peritonitis? Yeah, peritonitis is is um, extremely. Um, it, it's it's something that you know again alongside medications when you have these immune suppressant medications with Crohn's disease, because we do need to sort of remember that we're talking about the gastrointestinal symptoms a lot, but it's an autoimmune disease. So the medication is, is suppressing the immune system quite significantly. And when yeah. you have this suppression of the immune system, you tend to see a really hard to heal bacterial infections. So when you have bacterial infections, peritonitis or even sepsis is, is quite common um, in patients who have been on long-term uh, immune suppressant medications. Gotcha. Um, and the other thing I was going to ask about is a weird thing, a differential diagnosis, if you like, or a differential between, forgive me, not a diagnosis. Um, do I say the word pathognomonic? Uh, that it, it, this was way uh, a long time ago. So I don't know if this is current, but there was an interesting thing about smoking, that smoking mm -hmm. was would exacerbate Crohn's, but it could actually dampen ulcerative colitis. Mm. Is that still current thinking? Yeah, it is. Interestingly, when I was first diagnosed, it was um, considered to be protective for both. So 20 years ago, um, ulcerative colitis right. and Crohn's disease were thought to be dampened by by cigarette smoking. Uh, it's, it is a really fascinating topic. And I wonder if it's just because of the way that it impacts and, and suppresses the immune system, cigarette smoke. But the way that it does irritate the intestines, and we do know that cigarette smoke increases zonulin in the small intestine for patients with or without inflammatory bowel disease and with or without celiac disease. So does that increase intestinal permeability and then increase likelihood of a flare or even the onset of Crohn's disease? Whereas, you know, we're talking about zonulin in the small intestine, potentially maybe that's why it doesn't impact uh, negatively ulcerative colitis. You, you know what, I, I'm also wondering if there may be, I have no evidence for this, I'm wondering if there may be some link between uh, smoking and the upregulation of the two hydroxyestrogens. Hmm, so, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, th hmm, that would be a that would be that would lead to an association at least with a hormonal hmm. link, a sex hormone link. Have you we heard do. anything about the sex hormones with any other part of Crohn's? Yeah, I mean, we know that the incidence of Crohn's is the two times that we see it uh, being diagnosed is teenage years and then 50 plus. So, yes, and it's predominantly women. We know that there must be some kind of hormonal link, but it's all very tenuous kind of um, trying to connect the, that understanding at the moment. Um, but, you know, nicotine was used as, as a medicine at some stage. We did originally yeah. think it was this... The, a medication. So is it just the nicotine that is actually impacting ulcerative colitis in positively? So, yeah, so there's an interesting one. I, I wonder if anybody out there, any gastroenterologist is using nicotine patches as a therapy because um, we certainly don't want to espouse the use of smoking with the, you know, 100-odd carcinogens that you're inhaling every cigarette. But but I wonder if nicotine alone might be have some therapeutic effect. It would be really interesting I to look at. I feel like we're so far away from being able to utilize 
nicotine or discuss smoking as a benefit anymore. Even when we're talking about this now, you know, I haven't had a gastroenterologist say, talk to me about a positive link with smoking in 15 years. You know, at the time, mm. for the first five years I was diagnosed, it was it was a conversation. It was something that we could talk about, but it's, it's because of all the risks with smoking. I just don't think it's um, in favour of even discussing the benefits anymore. No, but that's what I'm saying. In, you know, I certainly wouldn't espouse smoking, but I could mm. possibly espouse nicotine patches. Mm. Interesting. To <laughs> anyway, um, Chloe, tell us a little bit about your journey. So when were you diagnosed? What age? I was 13. I was quite young. I was very right. sick for a long time before I was diagnosed. Um, I was probably... You know, my mum would say I had Crohn's disease from birth, really. I was very sick as a child. Right. I had chronic otitis media. I had all the risk factors, um, you, chronic use of antibiotics. I wasn't breastfed. I was allergic to, to cow's milk and I was brought up in soy milk formula. Um, chronic ear infections, lots of anxiety as a small kid. And then at 12, I had um, very early, I got glandular fever. And from then, it was a year of severe illness until I was finally diagnosed. Okay, so this takes us into a, a whole area of infection as a possible etiological factor in Crohn's yeah. disease. Can you yeah. take us through this? This is really interesting, very controversial. But Tom Barodi, yeah. Professor Tom Barodi, has done some work on this. Not that it's accepted, but interesting. Yeah, he's always pushing the envelope. So when it comes <laughs> to bacterial infections, I mean, they still use um, antibiotics frequently for flare-ups of Crohn's disease. So the, mm. it's it's known. We know that there's some form of infection there. And the, the predominant antibiotic that's used is metronidazole, which is a very broad-spectrum antibiotic. Um, Professor Barodi did propose a similar treatment to H. pylori at one stage, saying that there was going to be a triple antibiotic therapy for Crohn's disease, which I've never seen actually come to fruition. I've never seen anyone trial that in, in practice when I've, when I've seen patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, he looks at mycoplasma as a role in Crohn's. There's also mm. MAPS bacteria, so um, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, MAPS stands for, I'm pretty sure, but I'll uh, double-check that one for you. The Av MAPS bacteria, avium. yeah, avium, I'm pretty sure it is. Hmm. Mycobacteria. I will list that one down. Pardon? I will list that one down. It's just, it's MAPS bacteria in milk. And the MAPS bacteria in milk has been shown to cause a gastrointestinal illness in animals. And it's well known that it causes a gastrointestinal illness in animals. The symptoms are extremely similar to Crohn's disease. And there, we do know there's also a link between a dairy allergy or an intolerance to dairy as a child and the development of inflammatory bowel disease later on in life. So it's, wow. there's two mechanisms there where we suspect that dairy has a role in Crohn's disease, although unfortunately we're still not seeing mainstream medical professionals um, recommending a dairy-free diet. It's, you know, everyone's very afraid of us not getting enough calcium. So it's not being recommended mm. even though there are multiple links to dairy and Crohn's disease. Yeah. You could then go with regards to calcium. It was very interesting about... Um... Was it Lauren Cordain, um, the paleo diet? Um, and he was talking. I remember to set this up, I had two dietitians sitting next to me who were extremely interested in his comment about people always talk about intake, but they never talk about loss of calcium. And uh, uh, a dairy free diet certainly might have, certainly might not have the intake of calcium, but it also doesn't have the <laughs> phosphate, which causes the leakage of calcium out of your body. So it's a real interesting thing. It's not just as simple as saying in your mouth equals what you get. We've got to talk about net gain uh, or loss. A hundred percent. I don't understand why we are encouraging people to keep consuming foods that they specifically are not digesting. There is no point mm. to having a food that you're not digesting because you're not going to get the nutrients out of that until we heal the gut. So, you know, dairy is something that I feel really passionately about that everyone should trial, all, all IBD patients should trial a dairy-free diet. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about the MAPS bacteria, I think it's really important to note that it is present in pasteurised milk. 
So you can't just go, oh, we pasteurize our milk in Australia. We don't have the bacteria. Untrue. We do still have MAPS bacteria in pasteurized milk in Australia. Wow. Okay. Uh, Chloe, can I go a little bit back again to your childhood? So you were diagnosed in the days before we had these new um, treatment options, the monoclonal antibodies, yeah. the MABs. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the most famous is atalimumab. Um, I think it's quizzical that all of these monoclonal antibody names are so hard to pronounce that people are pronouncing them with the trade name pointedly mm -hmm. because the generic mm -hmm. name is so hard to pronounce. But anyway, that's mm -hmm. another political argument. Um, uh, but you you were diagnosed and, and managed in the days before the MABs were out. So can you take us through a little bit of your medical journey? And indeed, yeah. is it because of that medical journey that you were drawn towards natural medicine? Is that what drew you? I, I vehemently rejected natural medicine when I was diagnosed. My poor mum tried her absolute best to get me to take some fish oil and some magnesium. And I thought oh, I was one of these kids that was like, as a teenager, I said to my mum, if it was real medicine, my doctors would have told me to take that mum. <laughs> so she finds it very ironic that I did a full 180 and I came back to natural medicine in my 20s. I credit my gastroenterologist, my pediatric gastroenterologist with getting into remission very quickly when I had a very severe, extensive Crohn's disease. So by the time I was diagnosed, I was um, hospitalised. Originally, they were going to hospitalise me for anorexia bulimia. And it wasn't until uh, my orthodontist. So I was sent to the orthodontist to get my braces removed because of all the ulceration in my mouth. And when the orthodontist looked in my mouth, I'd had severe um, abdominal pain for a year, lots of diarrhoea, lots of um, fatigue. I was just quite a mess. And he looked in my mouth and he was the one who said to my mum, I think she has Crohn's disease. And so wow. when I was finally hospitalised with Crohn's, yeah, it's quite cool actually. I still credit how well he noticed that. He had a dental assistant mm. with Crohn's disease and so he recognised oh. it and he could tell by the back of my teeth that I wasn't vomiting. So where the ulcers were suspected oh, right. to be vomiting, he could tell by the back of my teeth that I wasn't vomiting at the time. You know um, what's interesting from... there? You know what's interesting there is uh, we're, we're crediting, um, you know, your dental uh, practitioner, an orthodox practitioner, but pointedly it's because he had a close associate. So mm -hmm. he, was, he was intimate with the knowledge and the issues of Crohn's, whereas people who know about Crohn's disease, they don't get it until it's real. And mm -hmm. it's, it, forgive me, the reason I'm saying this is because time and time again I'm seeing, and more and more I'm seeing, stories of orthodox physicians who have been struck down by a condition and, oh, mm -hmm. my God, they can't believe the journey they're having. It, this isn't what medicine was supposed to be like, you know? Yeah. It's really interesting when they're on the other side of the fence. Yeah. Or the lens. I always mm. I always wonder with my gastroenterologist as a child whether they had their own personal experiences. And I, I kind of wish that I'd had that shared with me at the time. Um, it's it seemed like a very strange profession to me as a teenager. Why would somebody mm. choose to put a camera in somebody's bum? Why would you do that? And it makes sense to me now that I specialise in Crohn's disease. When I was so far away from that interest as a teenager, it makes sense to me now that I'm passionate about it, yes, because I've experienced it and because I've been misdiagnosed and mistreated for a lot of my time. And I, I don't want to say I was mistreated by my paediatric gastroenterologist because I think they did such a fantastic job. They put me on trials of probiotics from a young age. They used, I was on an NG tube when I was hospitalised and nil by mouth for a few weeks, which really put me into remission a lot quicker than they ever expected. So I have a lot of, um, I have, I'm so grateful to my paediatric gastroenterologist for what they did for me. What I found, though, was that I was, I was not able to live a full life well, after I was diagnosed until I discovered naturopathic medicine. I was constantly unwell with 
you know, conjunctivitis, viruses, infections. I was on immune suppressants on and off. I had swollen joints. I couldn't play sport anymore. I was so, um, I, was a, I was a shell of my, of my former self. And because I was in remission, it wasn't considered a problem with my medication wow. and it wasn't considered a problem with the Crohn's disease anymore. So it was only when we started to understand the autoimmune perspective of Crohn's disease that I finally had this aha moment years after I was diagnosed that my arthritis was actually related to the Crohn's disease. And seeking naturopathic help was when I finally got my life back in a lot of ways, my quality of life back. Right. Um, you were mentioning as well the ages of presentation, the common ages of mm. presentation, puberty and menopause-ish. Mm. Mm. Those periods are classically um, periods of higher stress. Mm -hmm. How much of an impact does stress play mm -hmm. on the flare of Crohn's? Mm. I would say that it is, of all the autoimmune diseases, I would say that Crohn's is one of the most closely linked with stress and flare-ups. Um, I have, I've rarely seen, you know, I, I see other patients with autoimmune diseases and I've seen a few teenagers with autoimmune thyroid conditions and I definitely see a link between stress, but it's just not as, it's not as strong as, as it is with inflammatory bowel disease. It is a high high stress period, so those times when people are, are having their first incidences of symptoms, onset of symptoms, or major flare-ups. <clears throat> In saying that, it's, uh, you know, I think we talk about diet a lot as management of Crohn's disease, but what I really try to stress to my patients is you don't need to have this really restrictive diet if you're managing your stress really well. And that really kind of clicks people into, oh, okay, I really need to do this because I want to go out and have a glass of wine sometimes. I want to go and be able to have dinner with some friends. It's something that if you manage your stress levels, then you know reducing medication becomes a possibility, reducing supplementation becomes a possibility, and being able to relax your diet becomes a possibility by managing stress levels. You know, that's answered something I was, I was questioning myself about saying it because I was thinking, hang on, Andrew, are you just seeing something that might um, that's very hard to answer from a causal relationship? For instance, mm. did the stress cause the flare-out or did the flare-out cause mm. the stress um, flare-up? Mm. Um, but what you're saying now is that really it is the stress because it allows you mm. to pull back on supplements and possible medication, Yeah. Yeah, but isn't that a great point? Because, you know, we see a lot of autoimmune diseases in women, right? Like it's it's four to one, mm. women to men, autoimmune diseases. Yeah. And women are the ones who, when they have symptoms, they seek help. When they have symptoms, they are more likely to feel quite anxious about their health. Is that perpetuating a lot of their symptoms? The anxiety of the original symptoms are perpetuating further symptoms in a lot of way. And that's a huge part of my practice is counselling and forcing people to go inward and manage how they're really perceiving their own health and how they can help manage their stress levels internally because you can't always manage your external stresses. And and also isn't it possibly a telling <laughs> thing about how lazy men are and just how much women do for everybody else? Men are the caregivers, sorry, women are the caregivers, yeah. the cooks, the cleaners, the counsellors of all the family, you know, the they're there, daddy's got a cold. Um, <laughs> You know, women take on a lot um, and they yeah. give a lot of yeah. and from themselves. So, you know, I think there's a big lesson here for men. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, so can it, we talk? How hugely protective has it been? Like how lucky are men yeah. to be able to protect themselves from these autoimmune diseases because they can pass the buck in a lot of senses. Yeah. And it blows my mind that... My generation still has this pattern. I really, I grew up in a world where men and, and women were very equal and I was able to do all the things that the boys were allowed to and all the boys were allowed to do the things that the girls were allowed to, yet we still see a total imbalance when people are getting married and having children. In my generation, it's still, it's still so common. 
Look, there, there's oh, we could get off onto a whole podcast here about stereotypes yeah. <laughs> and, and miso misogynistic terms and things like that. Like even things like dowdy. Mm -hmm. The word dowdy is only used to describe a woman. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a funny um, eight out of ten cats does countdown <laughs> episode on that. But anyway, I won't go there. It's rude. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's it's really interesting how stress is the the foundation or the rotting foundation of mm -hmm. so many conditions mm -hmm. um you know and if you if you can't do this it's so hard to build upon so mm -hmm. can i f go into how your patients present because obviously you know when somebody's talking yeah. about their own personal journey that's one mm -hmm. presentation whereas mm -hmm. presentations change from a population yep. level tell us about them and yep. how they present what are their main fears and issues that they come to see you about yeah that's a great question because i actually find myself to have quite an atypical crone so I, I i enjoy sharing about it but i have to really detach when i'm practicing a lot because i see very different symptoms abdominal pain still seems to be the predominant but a food mm. fear and an inability to be able to um, read through the bs of what is healthy for Crohn's disease is what people come to see me for. And right. the way that I can best describe that is the way the difference in nutritional information out there for Crohn's, it, it's so vast. So, you know, you were talking about a paleo diet, which, you know, there's definitely evidence for a simple carbohydrate diet for Crohn's, which is very, um, that has been very successful in some patients with Crohn's disease and it's very similar to a paleo diet. There's also a low residue diet where you're cutting out all your fibers and you're allowed things like jelly and milk and we sort of go and lollies in moderation and high fructose corn syrup because they're low fiber and that's a very mainstream medico diet approach uh, so that i would say diet and trying to filter through that information is the main thing people come to talk to me about and the presentation is just this like a lot of people are still on medication when they come to see me they're usually pre-diagnosed before they come in and they just don't feel 100 percent. they're tired all the yeah. time they have food intolerances and end up with you know three days of diarrhea still even though their blood work comes back perfect um there's a lot of uh malaise you know it's this real like you know my doctors say i'm fine now but i just don't feel fine like i just don't think that i'm getting the most out of my life how, how do they say that my doctor says i'm fine but i'm not <laughs> yeah well isn't that so common though in our industry is it, my blood work but is that is, because the labs yeah <clears throat> is that because the labs look normal so therefore you must be normal yeah, and I think lab work is a really important one that does come back very normalised with medication with Crohn's disease and that's a main way that we uh, check whether medications are working is, you know, has the CRP come down? So, you know, if we're talking about lab work, what I'm looking for is, you know, is this person still st struggling with anemia? Is it anemia from chronic inflammation? Is it anemia from iron deficiency or B12 deficiency? Um, is there high C-reactive protein? Is it high at a low grade? Is it a five, six, seven, up to 11? Or is it 70 or 140? You know, the labs can come back at four or five, a CRP, and the doctors will say fine. And we know that that lab range means that there's a low grade chronic inflammation there. Or it can come back at right. 70 or 100 with Crohn's disease as well. Um, gotcha. So, what was the original question? Oh, um, well, to here? follow on from that, <laughs> to follow on from that, I was very interested when I podcasted with um, Detise Karazian. And his work, with his work on autoimmune conditions, not specifically Crohn's, mm -hmm. um, he'd set up this panel where he could actually predict whether somebody was going to a flare or a remiss or yeah. a remission. So it, it wasn't it, you are now, it's you are going to be. Really interesting is this stuff. The, is this the Prometheus? Oh, I don't know. Um, There's, look up um, to T. Skrazian. Is he in the US? Yeah. Yeah, there's um there's an amazing gastroenterologist called Alana. 
I want to say Gurevich. I'm going to double check that. Um, she talks to Prometheus as a, as lab markers. We just don't have that access to those lab markers. So I use GI map um, as a microbiome mapping. So I use testing that yeah. looks at the stool test to be able to predict a flare up or the likelihood of onset of symptoms for the first time as well. Um, things like that come back in a stool test, it's calprotectin. So in the Prometheus, they talk about cal calprotectin a lot, but it is far yeah. more um, prominent in ulcerative colitis because it shows that that um, distal colonic inflammation, white blood cells increasing in that area, more so than small intestinal inflammation. So it tends to come up more so in ulcerative colitis. Um, we're also looking at zonulin. So as I spoke to you, spoke to before, high zonulin levels are high are in seen in Crohn's patients and ulcerative colitis patients, but more so in Crohn's patients with that small intestinal inflammation and in increased intestinal um, permeability. So the other the other markers that you can look for um, your CRP, your ESR, so your inflammatory markers in the blood. Um, anemia and looking at the way that the iron is balanced. So, you know, low serum iron, high ferritin and um, low hemoglobin is a, is a surefire sign. There's something really um, very intricate, like a very ingrained inflammatory response going on right now to get to that stage. I, um, I actually yes, think, so I, I actually think just you mentioning a few of those, I do remember like, I think there was interleukin one B. I'm not sure, but but CSR, um, mm. sorry, hypersensitive, um, CRP, C reactive protein, CRP, CSR. Yep. Um, where did I get that from? Cal calprotectin, um, ferritin, uh, and and I think it was tied in with as you say your your uh, white blood cells or a full blood count. Um, mm. It was very interesting. I'll, I'll have to look up what he what he spoke about, but it was really interesting. Um, before we move on, I just want to go back a little bit, just to touch on something you said about a low residue diet. I remember mm -hmm. gastroenterologists putting people on, as you said, it like a nil by mouth. But you're that's you're talking fed parenterally, correct? Parenterally, um, whereas I've heard of patients being put on a milk, uh, you know, 1.5 calories per mil formula mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just as a like an oligo antigenic um, diet for a couple of weeks. Have you found benefit of that or is it still it's milk, guys? Oh, not yet. It's a, it's a very good question. The elemental diet has a very good role in managing Crohn's disease and has been shown to be as effective as steroids and other immune suppressant medications to put somebody into remission. It's it's really quite incredible. Um, unfortunately, the mainstream ones do have milk in them. And when I look back at things that are accessible to hospitals, even the um, the parenteral nutrition does have some element of uh, dairy protein in it. The difference oh, being really? is it has all the all the free amino acids. So you know you're breaking down all the free amino acids so that your your uh, small intestine doesn't have to work to actually absorb any nutrition. And that's where you see giving the small intestine that break is where you see remission. And I have seen remission even using um, nutrition liquid nutrition with um, dairy, with dairy in it as well. I have seen that. Uh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, can we go further into the assessments that you use, Chloe? Um, yeah. Perhaps in a sort of more formal, you are mentioning GI map. What is it that you see or mm -hmm. that you're looking out for to try and predict a flare or e even a remission? What are you looking at? Yeah. So the main things I'm looking for is, Calprotectin, uh, that's that's a no-brainer, and um, mm. blood in the stool. So if there's blood in the stool and high calprotectin, it's you have to refer. So that I just need to kind of really make sure that that's known that we need to refer if there's ever blood in the stool. If there's blood in the stool, it can just be from a small hemorrhoid, unfortunately, that we're referring for this tiny little hemorrhoid. Mm. And anyone who's had chronic IBS and IBD has is going to probably have some form of hemorrhoids at some stage. So, you know, blood in the stool, calprotectin, mucus. Mucus is a really good sign for Crohn's disease, whereas calprotectin is a better sign for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease in the colon. 
Um, other things I look for in terms of bacteria, it actually, the, in one of the GI maps, you can actually see the MAPS bacteria. So having a look if there is MAPS bacteria there and Klebsiella as well, they're two really big ones that come up in Crohn's disease and really help direct nutritional advice if you see Klebsiella and MAPS bacteria. Now, that's really interesting you mentioned Klebsiella because Professor Alan Ebringer has done work with ankylosing spondylitis and mm -hmm. he was talking about, I, I said this incorrectly in another podcast, so what he was talking about was basically an infection in the gut with Klebsiella and there was mm -hmm. a cross-reactivity with the immune system um, for Klebs and that, that was causing the flare in ankylosing spondylitis mm -hmm. and therefore the tissue destruction. And he put them on a low carb diet. Now he used antibiotics yeah. and certain other agents. Have you, are you familiar with his work? I'm familiar with the treatment for Klebsiella in terms of a, a simple carbohydrate diet is treats at Klebsiella. Gotcha. And it should be noted ankylosing spondylitis and IBD so closely linked, so commonly right. seen together. Gotcha. This is just falling into place now. I mm. knew he was a good guy. <laughs> He's such a he was wow. such a lovely, quiet gentleman. He was a beautiful, yeah. beautiful man. Very mm. quietly spoken, but plodding along in his own sort of thing, being laughed at by the Orthodox medicos. And he's professor of St. John's College, I think, in one of the unis in, in England. It's very cool to see mainstream medicos look at this. So there is actually quite, because Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease in general is really, it's not very well understood in its pathogenesis and where it starts from. There's so many theories out there that there is, and because we're actually seeing it in pediatric patients more and more, what I find when it goes into pediatric patients is there's a push to look at things that are non-medicated. So looking at um, parenteral nutrition, elemental diets, Probiotics, there's a lot of research into probiotics and mm. inflammatory bowel disease. There's research into curcumin, boswellia, wormwood. There's actually, it's pretty interesting to see. And a lot of the time it's actually started by mainstream gastroenterologists that just are so sick of the main um, treatment protocols they have. And you spoke to the, yeah. to the, to the medication that they're using nowadays, the biologic medications, the ones that work on tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, the adilimabs and things like that, those medications before that came along, what, 10, 15 years ago, it, the mm. medication protocols for Crohn's were just really, they were not great. They were, they no. were not putting people into remission for long periods and we were just seeing increases in incidence of diagnoses and in increases of incidence in surgeries before those medications came along. Gotcha. Um, now, you said something there that was really interesting, and that was about not the medications. Uh, oh, that's right. Um, Orthodox Medicos now looking at natural agents. I was looking at um, mm -hmm. the GISA, the Gastroesophageal uh, Society of Australia, and mm -hmm. so GESA, um, .org.au, I think it is. And if you look up the practice guidelines for inflammatory bowel disease and then you scroll down and down and down to Crohn's, turmeric yeah. is there. Yeah. The it is. Orthodox there's actually, guidelines. There's actually, there's actually research on curcumin and adilimab and, like, looking at them uh, in, in a controlled study to tell whether curcumin is a good alternative all very preliminary research. I am not suggesting that anybody goes out there and takes their, takes their patients off these biologic medications and puts them onto curcumin and expects to have a good result because coming off those medications, there is a high risk of a big flare up. So you need to be very mm. careful. But the research going into it is incredible. My wish is that they wouldn't put people on these medications so quickly. I understand why they're doing it. It's because they are seeing that surgery is delayed. So when people are using these medications, they're seeing that they, they're staying another five years without surgery. Um, right. I'm really interested to see how this actually progresses because clinically I'm seeing more surgery, really. I'm seeing a lot of people with who have ileostomy and colostomy bags already, and that's a completely different treatment protocol again. 
Um, but yeah, the research into curcumin is really fascinating. Boswellia has been around for like fifth, oh, 10 years. They've been doing, they did research on Boswellia and compared it to DMARDs. So this is when DMARDs were used, things wow. like sulfasalazine and lisalazine. They use those to put patients with Crohn's disease into remission before they have biologics. That was quite common. Um, I'm not seeing it as frequently anymore. But they were using Boswellia as an alternative and finding good, really good results with Boswellia. All preliminary. Right, so DMARDs. Really small study. Yeah. Sorry, just, just for everybody listening or watching, DMARDs are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, Chloe. Go on. Forgive me. I'll cut you no, off. That's okay. That's, you know, so th that's the other one. The other thing that I'm finding there's a lot of research on is um, you, the use of probiotics. So I sort of spoke to that a little bit before. There's like these multi-strain probiotics and they're looking at the way that they can modulate the immune system. And, you know, going back to the GI map, we see commonly a decrease in good bacteria. It's just, is that where it starts? And that is, that's probably my favorite hypothesis is when we look at the hygiene hypothesis, how we have this really depressed uh, microbiome in our IBD patients and in our Western societies. We don't have the diversity in our microbiome anymore. Mm. We are using, mm. and our poor children are going to have, of this generation, are going to be obsessed with hand sanitizer. And yeah. I just fear for their microbiomes. <laughs> I like, I think about that. I lay awake thinking about this at night. Um, and that, that this I is where you. we see it. We don't know Jesus. <laughs> But yeah, so, like there's, there's, it goes further than that with our kids because in a, in such a litigious society, um, I mean, monkey bars are out. You mm -hmm. can't play on monkey bars as a kid because kids mm -hmm. break legs. Kids have always broken yeah. legs. Give them a tree and they'll break a leg. Um, it's re just really interesting. And the problem is because everybody's concerned about being sued. That's mm -hmm. it. And so we're just getting less and less adventurous. I understand risky behaviour. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking yeah. about is normal, everyday play in dirt. I mean, it's almost like you can't go out and get muddy. <laughs> not all. Yes, I love that. Get them out and in dirt. That is, I just, you know, every kid that comes in and uses hand sanitizer as soon as they come in from the dirt, I just, <laughs> I cry a little inside. But this is, you know, this is where... <laughs> This is something that I think is probably one of the best hypotheses for for the development of Crohn's disease is this really depressed um, uh, microbiome diversity numbers. And you just see it constantly with GI maps. So you see the acomancia is decreased. Um, the presnitsi is, is de decreased. You see butyrate is low, um, high, yeah. high incidence of... Um, fat malabsorption so you know that fat's mm. going through and dysregulating all of the all the all the bacteria un, undigested all that kind of stuff so it's really uh you know it's about building as much as it's about clearing and from a mainstream medico we go around with antibiotics clear it all out let's get rid of the bacteria and then naturopathically we need to start rebuilding and this is where the simple carbohydrate diet and the low residue diet using them at the right times is really important and introducing fibers at the right time is really important as well you know um, i just a point you made it uh just before about our missing microbes indeed i don't know if you can see it behind me in there but there's the book called missing microbes from dr martin blazer do I say doctor or professor? Um, and he he addresses th indeed this issue about what's happened to our microbiome in general compared to the mm -hmm. hunter gatherer tribes around the world. Um, so if anybody's interested, missing microbe, missing microbes mm -hmm. by Martin Blazer, B L A S E R, I think it is. Um, so. Chloe, thank you. Can we go into a few more of the supplements that you employ? I remember your mum, you were saying about your mum employing fish oil or trying to get you to take fish oil. Oh. What about things like uh, cod liver oil with vitamin A and vitamin D and how they work with, you know, what is it, Fox P3 and um, and the other one, the yin and yang with the immunity in the yeah. gut? Yeah. I, I love fish oil for for trying to regulate the immune system, and I think that's a really important part. So when we're looking at Crohn's disease and treatment, it's about 
soothing the gut. So we need to make sure that the inflammation is soothed on one level. We need to make sure that we're modulating the immune system on another level. And the other level is actually increasing the way that we digest our food. So there's almost three different areas to go through. The way that I really like the, the, the treatment that I think is most important is the immune regulation because that's where we sort of, you know, talking about, um, you know, cod liver oil and, and fish oils regulating tea helper. So, you know, we're regulating the immune system because we do think that there's a role in tea helper in interleukin 10 specifically, dysregulation in Crohn's disease. So that means that ongoing we see tumor necrosis factor alpha in overplay. We see NF-kappa B is dysregulated as well. And so by using things that are, are modulate the immune system, the inflammatory processes like uh, fish oils, vitamin A, vitamin D, we can sort of start from that process. The thing that I caution though, is fat malabsorption and using fish oil when there's fat malabsorption. So I do like to make sure that the steatocrit is over 500. Uh, no, not over 500. I'm talking about pancreatic elastase is over 500. And steatocrit yeah. is well under under the reference range before we go in with fish oil. So using other things before that, like curcumin, um, wormwood, and Saccharomyces boulardii are other ones that have been shown to regulate the immune system as well. Now, you said wormwood. Yes. Why not I things like wormwood. berberine? I love wormwood, and it is such an underrated herb. And I'm talking about um, Artemisia absinthium. So it's only available in liquid in Australia, the, what, this wormwood. It is, there is research looking at assisting people coming off uh, corticosteroids and the steroid sparing effect of wormwood and how using them concurrently actually reduces the incidence of, of needing steroids in the future. It's pretty, it's a pretty cool little herb there that we just, I don't think we're using anywhere near enough. What about uh, combining it with licorice? Do you ever do that for its steroidal um, steroid sparing effect at all? Definitely, I love using licorice and or Romania. So depending on what else is going on, you know, if I have if I have a teenager, I love licorice. If I have somebody who is in their fifties, sixties, who is also on blood pressure medication, I'll pick Romania. Okay, I have to ask about hemidesmus. Do you ever use it? I used to use it a lot, actually. Um, I fell out of favour with it just because I wasn't seeing clinically that it was working as well as Wormwood. So it was no other reason. Like I, I used to use a hemidesmus Romania combination all the time. Mm. And it was just, I would definitely was seeing results, but I would just say it kind of fell down the ladder in its clinical improvements. I wasn't seeing it yeah, sure. as successful as other things okay uh, you mentioned probiotics a few times do you mm -hmm. i mean what the original research was on vsl number three um which is right. a combination of of certain bacteria um, mm -hmm. uh, um and it the research was mainly in decreasing inflammatory pouchitis is that right mm -hmm. it wasn't the... in really flare and maintenance it was in, there was actually, it was actually my own pediatric gastroenterologist who did some research into VSL number three in the early mm -hmm. 2000s and found that it reduced the incidence of, from memory, it was incidence of flare and severity of flare in, in ulcerative colitis, but not in Crohn's disease. That was the result. So that's oh, that's That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So probiotics, you've said Saccharomyces boulardii. Do you ever use any oh. of the... Let's face it, they're milk-based probiotics, most of them. I, Do you ever find them? Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't use, um, besides prolactobacillus rhamnosus, GG, I, I use quite a bit of. I use a lot of Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, I will, with ulcerative colitis patients, use that multi-strained um, probiotic, uh, high-dose probiotics in short term. But I would much rather look at, trying to increase the bowel flora with fibers when somebody's not in a, in acute flare so that's my main mechanism of improving the microbiome outside of using saccharomyces boulardii oh sb i would hesitate to say almost all my Crohn's patients start with with sb not everyone responds perfectly to it um but most find that really really effective is saccharomyces boulardii yeah. at a thousand milligrams daily 
Who'd have thunk that a little bit of um, what is it, mango steam fruit skin, could uh, could be give us a, such a wonderful natural drug? Um, what about you? You were speaking earlier about fat malabsorption, and if we're talking mm-hmm. about malabsorption, what's the point of giving fats? Mm-hmm. Don't we have to look at how we're digesting those fats? Yes, yes, yes. And this is where patients who have, this is, this is the different diets. So to kind of give you an overview of different diets, if somebody's had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis from a really young age, specifically Crohn's I should talk to, uh, from a really young age or has, you know, they could have gotten their 20s and they're now in their 50s or they've been misdiagnosed for a really long time. They've probably had it for 30 years. These are the patients who have a lot of damage to the small intestine. These are the patients where you have to heal the small intestine first before you start to reintroduce fats because otherwise it just, it's like putting oil on a fire and putting oil on a fire is just going to further aggravate that inflammation because you're not digesting the fats properly. Um, When somebody has been diagnosed in the in just the last few years they haven't had symptoms their whole life they probably had an infection that triggered something they had a huge stressful experience that triggered something um you know whatever their trigger was before that they didn't have a lot of symptoms those people fish oil they usually don't have the fat malabsorption so you can go with fish oil really early and you can do a simple carbohydrate diet really early and get really good results with those people Chloe, there's so much more to go into. And oh, we need you delivering seminars to practices. This is such golden information. Thank you for sharing it with us. Can I just ask quickly, because we have run out of time, where can Prackies find out more, at least in the initial stages? And please, 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 do you have any mentorship that you're looking at in the future? <laughs> please. Yes. I feel very passionately about treating Crohn's disease, as you can obviously tell, but I feel mostly passionately about the fact that you have to really go at it from a different perspective to other autoimmune diseases. So I do offer mentoring to other practitioners. Um, I can do, you know, that's always accessible. Great. And what about other sort of resources that you really think are, are, are worthy of practitioners to learn from? One of my favourite, as I said before, Alana Gurevich, I just don't want to how you spell her last name. Um, Alana Gurevich is a US practitioner and I find her information absolutely invaluable. Um, she talks about the different ways that she reads um, GI maps as well and I, I find that so fascinating. So she's got some really good podcasts that she's done with um, Michael Ruscio. I also really like Neurola Jacoby has some really great resources as well for SIBO and at the risk of starting another conversation, (laughs) SIBO, I'm sorry, I should have, I shouldn't start this now, but you know, looking at SIBO in Crohn's disease because of the the, the impact on the ileum and the ileocecal valve is really important. So I look at a lot of Neurola Jacoby's information. Podcast number two coming up. Thank yeah, you, sorry. Chloe, for taking us through. <laughs> to, thanks for taking us through this though today. It's been seriously, it's been invaluable, really eye-opening. And there's so many more questions that you go, hang on, but what, are that, what does that mean? But thank you so much for sharing is not just your personal journey, but also your dedication to your patients. Because it's clear, it's clear to see that you have their their best um uh their best um what do you call it? Interests. <sighs> their health interests thank you their best outcomes in mind thank you chloe gosh wowee um but thank you everyone for joining us today and you can find all of these resource sources and we'll put these up on the designsforhealth.com.au website so thank you very much for joining us today i'm andrew whitfield cook this is wellness by designs (music) 